How you going? This is Jake Kerr from Black Ink for podcast number three. I haven't actually uploaded podcast number two yet, but I'm just too excited about the whole process. So I wanted to keep going. Um, I do have Louie on my lap here if you're watching. Um, I have her on my lap only because if she sits on the ground, she causes me a nightmare and she ends up trying to eat things that she shouldn't eat and she goes outside when she shouldn't go outside and she just likes getting into everything. But She's my emotional support vehicle, so I, I bloody can't do without her. And also, I don't really have anyone that can look after her at the moment, so I just look after her. We just hang out all day together. But uh, what I want to talk about, it's actually really interesting. So just recently, I've uh, if you don't know what ASMR is, it's basically just like a category, or well, as far as I know, it's a category on YouTube of like very like highly sensual, like as in the, the sense of hearing, like activating sounds and, and images or like visuals that kind of like tickle the brain, so to speak. I don't necessarily like, I didn't come across what I've come across because I was in the ASMR category. I came across it because when I was in school, excuse me, I used to have this really like direct connection to the sound of pencils drawing on desks. So I would really like um, putting my ear down on the table and like then drawing on a piece of paper that was on the desk. And this is in primary school. If you remember the desks where the lid lift up, uh, lifted up or you would pull the drawer out from underneath, it had those really textured tops. I used to love the sound of that. So what I do when I'm doing my work in the morning, I actually like to find uh, like <laughs> super long videos of people drawing with Sharpies or drawing with textures and then just listen to that pretty much on like 75% volume and that way it kind of gives my mind something to grab hold onto while I, so I can just kind of get through my work and I can think about stuff. And typically like I get the same result, or I used to get the same result out of a podcast, but I found find like, I think my care level has gone through the roof and I can't have my kind of second mind thinking about a conversation. It just needs to be something that's just enough to keep me kind of intrigued and activated. And yeah, because I used to listen, I, I still do, I, I've listened to like three podcasts today. Pretty much I listen to podcasts as soon as they come out. They never sit in the bank, uh, you know, in, in the podcast app for me. I kind of have to listen to them straight away as if they're like hot news or something. But the thing I used to find is when I would listen to those podcasts, it gave, it gave me an opportunity to kind of concentrate on what I was concentrating on because I didn't have, it's kind of like I've got three people that are standing in a group that are trying to solve a problem at all times and the problem that I have is they all have a voice that's as loud as each other. So it's kind of like a podcast lets two of those voices or one of those voices go and like have a conversation with someone else while I'm figuring out what's going on. But this like finding the right ASMR video is kind of like the equivalent of like giving all three voices something to, to speak to at the same time. It's like, it's just so nice. Like it, because it's, because it's some sort of like substance without any like real purpose or meaning it's just something that's happening in the background it's really easy to like grab onto it and just kind of lose yourself in it so anyway uh you know how youtube works you you watch one one video about you know uh a sharpie drawing on this and then it turns into just falling into the asmr category and i had never even heard of this this thing before <clears throat> but basically it's listening to people getting massages. And I know how fucking wild that sounds from the get-go, but this is hilarious. So there's these, I'm guessing like, like sort of caravan um, kind of setups on the side of the road in India. And then there's these blokes that quite obviously have been giving these sorts of massages forever you can tell by the way they do it that it's something that like you, you could you could fake it till you make it for a couple of years and be pretty good at it but these guys you can tell by the way that the, even just the way the caravan or inside this little kind of hut is situated that or well, the way it's decorated you can tell that they've been there forever you know and just like everything that they do and the way they do it they do everything with such like seamless kind of one thing leads them to the next to the next to the next and then I'd say what's happened about, you know, two to five years ago, they've realized that they can make videos out of it and put it onto YouTube. And then those videos have then found the lane of ASMR. So basically it's not, uh, so, I mean, if you're, uh, you, you know, you, you think of a massage as like something where you lay down, face in the hole, take most of your clothes off, you, you get oil or whatever, or you get like a dry massage, whatever it might be. This massage is you're sitting upright in a seat and it's basically everything you can imagine that can be done to you sitting upright in that seat as a massage. And these guys, they go so 
like above and beyond what would be necessary because I feel like the competition, I feel like if you stepped outside of that van, because you have no perspective, you can only see kind of like a corner view up in the van and then every now and then you get like a side view and if it's a really dope video, they might have someone walking around with the camera as well. The microphones are turned right the fuck up. So like they're getting like, you can hear the the whistle as the, the dude's breathing in and out of his nose hairs. It's crazy. But the cool part about it is they kind of go way over the top. They take their job so seriously, and I'm guessing because there's probably like another 15 massage caravans or little huts or trailers, or whatever they are, you know, within spitting distance. So I like, I feel like these guys have found these little things that they do that, you know, may not look or even feel conventional, but they feel good. And they've like honed in on that and made it such an art of their own that it's like at a point now where it's undeniable. And Watching them is one, like listening to it is one thing. Watching it and listening to it is kind of like, it gets to a point where it surpasses being fun for the mind to like appreciate as an ASMR thing. And you just kind of like, I got to a point where I was laughing, but I was laughing through being impressed. I was like, I was entertained. I was like laughing and I was like, I was trying to break down and it's one of those things that when you watch it, you can't even break down why it's so impressive while it's happening. I literally had to take it away and like break it down to my mind and see like why why like I was thinking about these massages these dudes were giving to like other dudes who were like keep like completely clothed just sitting there kind of getting this massage I like kind of went away and had to like break down in my mind why I thought that was, this was cool I'll tell you a bit more about the massage so they sit there and like don't expect to have any sort of fa- fashionable hairstyle when you walk out of there because that's fucked from the moment you walk in there they're going to ruin your hair so they've got like squirty bottles and they've got uh, just a range of towels and like basically what they do is they just go nuts with squirting these water bottles and like just doing like all kind of crazy head rubs and like rubbing under your eyes and like doing these really repetitive things. But then on top of that, they like, there's this one, I, I should I should know this, I might even leave a, a link to one of them in the description so you have a bit more of an idea so you can see where I'm coming from. I have this one dude though, I love watching him and he's he has this thing where he, like he tells you to relax he relax, relax, relax. And then he'll do something and he'll disappear for a bit. And then he'll come back and relax, relax and get back into rubbing your hair and squirting water up in the air. But then they also do this thing. And I don't, I'm speaking out of complete like ignorance and negligence. I don't know what I'm talking about. Like I, this is just what I like have taken in from the little bits that I've like looked across at my phone and be like, oh, that's what he's doing. But they really incorporate their own breathing into the massage. And it's almost like sometimes I'll even do these, these like, actions around the person getting a massage where they're not even touching them but they're like scooping away this energy or they'll be putting energy into it and you know once you've like seen that a couple times you're imagining in your head when you're listening to it you're like oh that they must be doing that particular part of the massage to the person while it's happening you look across at the phone screen and sure enough that's what they're doing this crazy like "Mm, mm, mm," like that like it's it's such a like an involved process that when you're watching you're like oh Okay, cool. I don't, I don't know how that's a massage, but also I'm so fucking impressed that I, I don't even care at this point. And to be honest, I kind of want one, you know, I kind of want one of these massages because it's so it's, it relates to that feeling of like laying your head down on the table and using the pencil and hearing the, the lead go over each part of the textured part of the, the desk. You know, there's something about like, it's just so true. And I think the thing that I, the, well, the thing that I take away now that I've thought about it for a bit is that they do really fucking good jobs. They realize that that's their job in that moment and they're just doing it really well. And I think like it's hard to relate back to the pencil on the table, but it's just, there's something about something being done from the beginning to the end that I really like. I really, really like a whole job being done properly. And I like when people take their jobs so seriously that they surpass what they look like and they surpass how they feel about doing the job. They're so oriented about the task that nothing else matters. And the awesome part about this is the end result of it is somebody's feeling. Somebody is feeling directly better because of how much effort they're putting into it. And that's the thing that I like. The thing, I was having this conversation with someone who I just dropped off some jumpers to now. I feel like now I have my own business. I have this beautiful opportunity to do my absolute best work in everything that I do. And I spoke about this on the earlier podcast, 
when I take on a new job or when I try and learn about a new element of my business that I'm exploring or looking to like expand or even if I'm just looking to to change something, how I do my business so I can make it slightly better, I have this opportunity to completely embrace what that is and do my best, do my absolute best. And the thing is like, you say, well, you know, you can do this when you've got a normal job and you can. And the thing is like, I really did. When I had a normal job, I would put in, it's an interesting um, equation, but in my mind, it comes down to a reasonable amount of effort that is justifiable to myself and justifiable to the boss. Because, and I think like people do know if they are this sort of person, I'm genuinely happy to hang after work for an hour and wash the truck or have a chat with the boss or whatever it might be, even if there's no money involved, because it, it does, does something for me. It, it makes me feel like if I scooped a little bit more in at the end, if, if, you know, if I got that done, then it was fucking worth it. You know, like even if it makes just the boss's job a little bit easier in the morning, whatever it is. But obviously the problem that you find is a lot of jobs that you that you get, especially like if you work for a company, a bigger company, that effort kind of goes unseen. And even if you've got a supervisor or a manager who's really switched on and does see it, it doesn't actually equate to anything. You're just a good bloke to that person, you know? And I feel like <clears throat> it comes down to that justifiable amount of energy that you're going to expend in hope that it's going to maybe financially or, you know, some sort of energy is going to come back to you in a positive way. And the thing about having your own business is it like, if I do a good job, everyone's happy. The people who are giving me money for, for my product, they're getting the best possible version of that product in the best possible process in the best possible way. And they're going to enjoy it as much as possible. You know, it's, it's really easy just to make a product and fucking send it to someone. It's also heaps easier if you're like this way inclined to take every possible opportunity to maximize, to turn the dial up on how the experience can be bettered for the end customer. And the thing about these guys that do massages is they've taken every part of their job, like the squirty bottles, the, the fucking, the throwing the arms out, the pushing the energy away, the bringing the energy in, the rubbing the fuck out of people's scalps, the, all the movements on the eyes and all the, just even down to like, you can tell when they've got nothing going on, these guys are cleaning the corners of their van so that everything's right. And the cool part about that is they're not even really doing it for the customer. They're doing it for themselves. They're doing it so that they can, like, this is the, this is the narrative that I run in my mind. They're doing it so that they have this sense of like, well, I'm doing the very best that I can. So therefore, why would you go to the guy down the street? Why would you, why would you not come to me? Why would you not want my massage? If I do the absolute best that I can, I'm undeniable, right? And I feel like the thing that is missing from, I think, uh, I don't want to say society because it just, it paints a too broader, broader picture. But I think that's the thing that's missing from like, I'm 28 years old. I would say my generation and down is the permission to do really fucking well. To, to like, when you get a job, to embrace that you have a job and that that is your job. And regardless of if you want it or not, that's where you're at right now. And therefore, you should be doing the very best. And I feel like some people see that almost as like a, <clears throat> like a burden. You know, like I spoke about shoveling shit for, shoveling horse shit for the first couple of years of, um, for the first couple of years of my working life. And, you know, I was never better than shoveling shit. I embraced that I was 13 and I had a hard labor job. That's when you do the hard labor jobs. The idea is your shoes should get cleaner the older that you get. I mean, if you if your first job is wearing a suit and doing all the rest, you don't know what it's like to have dirt under your nails. You don't know what it's like to, to fucking be... I remember I got pulled over and trodden on by a, a horse that was trying to get to a colt. Like, just having a bloody... Just, it's one of those things where like, I feel like you miss out on some of the opportunity to build fiber within yourself and you also miss that lesson of like, don't be scared of being good. Don't be scared of like getting a little bit dirtier. When it starts raining, don't be scared of getting wet. When it gets muddy, don't be scared of getting your boots wet and your socks drenched and all the rest. Like understanding that there is some sort of unspoken... I mean, those who work hard, they get it. This is not new news to anyone. Maybe I'm just kind of restructuring what this information is and you're hearing it a little bit differently. But people who work hard understand that there is some sort of character development that comes in doing things that are optionally difficult. And I mean, Joe Rogan speaks about this all the time. But I think the thing with, with, with like my generation and especially this generation that's coming through now that are starting to get jobs and enter the workforce and all that, I feel like they don't feel like they have permission to do a good job. I feel like it's almost attractive 
And for sure, I mean, my generation and the generation before me definitely do, this does apply to them as well, but they find it kind of attractive to put as much energy into trying to not do the job as what they should be just doing the job. They try and they put as much energy into finding a way around what they should be doing rather than taking the road to doing it. And I think that's fucking bizarre. I think that when you're putting in like, and this is the thing, like I speak like this because I've definitely spent probably combined years of my life trying to get away from the job. And that, you know, that without getting too deep, that does come down to a point of just fucking hating yourself and where you're at in your life and whether it might come down to debt or the job itself or home life or whatever it might be. And I'm not saying that it was any of those things for me. I'm just saying typically that's that's where it ends up. That's kind of the foundation of, of trying not to do a job properly is you feeling like you don't belong there or you feel like you deserve something better than what you're doing. So therefore it's like, fuck, I'm better than high pressure cleaning or I'm better than this, I'm better than that. So you just try and like mosey on through as if, you know, Dude, if you're better than it, just show them. Just show them. I give you permission to be the baddest motherfucker at high pressure cleaning if you think that you shouldn't be there. Because the reality is, the world actually does pay attention when you do a good job. The world doesn't care if you're doing a mediocre job, and the world definitely doesn't care unless they're telling you off or reprimanding you for it if you do a shit job. But if you do a good job, fuck man, you're not going to be high pressure cleaning for long. And the reality is like, that's where I put all of my faith, right? So I might get a little bit upset that I don't have the orders that I thought I wanted. But if I get too worried about not having double the orders that I want and not really honing in and making sure these orders that I do have are fucking good, then how can I expect to get these orders? How can I expect to return customers? How can I expect that people are going to find me and be wowed by me in a way that no one else is wowing them in my industry? Well, I can't. But what I can do is make an agreement with myself that if I do put in 100% effort, 110%, I'm pushing for 115% effort in everything that I do, then I can go to sleep thinking, well, fuck, if I fail, it's because I was missing information. It wasn't because I didn't try. If I fail, it's because there was a part of the plan that didn't go to action because whatever the reason, if I fail, it doesn't mean because I thought, uh, you know, I would have done better if I got 1,000 orders instead of 500, or I would have, I would have made it if I just got... You know, 75% what? No, 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 no. I can say that everyone who orders from me gets the best possible product they can to my ability at that time. And the thing that I can take away from that is when I go back and have to, you know, if I have to retouch something that I did months ago or whatever, I know that I didn't 50% do that with the idea of coming back to it later. I 100% did it. So I'm building on top of a foundation. I'm not going to rip it up and start again. So I think the thing on a like fundamental level that I'm enjoying from this ASMR, these videos of these blokes giving massages, is the fact that they're embracing what they're doing and they're giving, they've gone so far beyond just the standard thing of a massage. They've paid attention to their clients. They've got feedback and they've got to a point now where they're recording these videos with supreme confidence, with hundreds of thousands of views on these videos and just sending it. They've given themselves permission to be the best possible version of themselves they can be in that situation. And I get to visually and, and, audioly, and audibly like feel that and experience that. And I think that is what my mind grabs onto so nicely when I'm trying to do things and that's playing in the background. It's like these guys that are just giving it their all, but because it's massage, it's in a gentle way. It's in, in almost like an intimate way. It's like the same way that, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone else is the same, but I love being around people doing things. Like if my partner is coloring in in a coloring in book and she's changing pencils or pens, you know, every 45 seconds to a minute and a half intervals, oh my God, the sound of the pens irregularly going in, um, up and down off the table is fucking blue cheese. It's amazing. The the fact that there is no like, uh, what do you call it? There's no like, um, there's no system to it. There's no regularity to it where it would be exactly every 30 seconds. The fact that she could do like, and sometimes it'll take, you know, like she, she might be coloring for like five. I'm not even saying this is something she does. What I'm saying is like, I can tell this would be a great example. And I've had it in the past where like, she might spend five minutes on one color. And you're listening to the thing. And she comes over here. And then the sound of that pencil going down, the next pencil coming up, fuck me, game over. That's, that's the best shit in the world. I love it. I love it. And the cool thing about this, like, 
I think the thing about the the combination of everything here is the irregularity of like not actually knowing what's going to come next with the massage, but knowing that whatever it is, it's not going to be a half ass attempt where it's like, you know, spray a bit of water. Nah, man, empty half the fucking bottle on this dude's head and then completely mess up his hair. Fucking flick it all back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just fucking just send it, you know, it's so cool. And like going, going back to the, to, to my previous point, that permission that you give yourself to do something really well is empowering. It's, it's like, it's kind of overwhelming when you get the hang of it. When you like give yourself this thing where like, I find that like, obviously I hang out to do the work that I do because I love what I'm doing at the moment, which is on a side note, absolutely fucking amazing. If you're not doing that in some part of your life, I'm telling you, figure that out because it's a fucking cool thing. Even if other people aren't on board, you can feel better in your mind about what's happening. But once you've found it and it can be like, one, it's kind of like addictive because I find that once I started doing it with anything, you start doing it with everything. And that 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 in itself, like I, I even find, you know, you know, you'll be picking up sticks in the yard after there's been a bit of wind and all the sticks have been knocked out of the tree. It's like you get to a point where you're picking up these little baby twigs on the ground, but it doesn't matter because you're picking up anything that is a stick and you're giving yourself permission to stay out there as long as that job takes. And part of that job is picking up sticks. And no matter what the size of the stick, each of the sticks need to be picked up regardless if they're big or small. So picking up a small stick doesn't matter, even though it won't make any visual difference to the end of the job. Because you've given yourself permission, the result doesn't even matter that much. It's the task. And I find myself like I might take 20% longer to do most jobs around the house that need to be done just for the sake of doing them a little bit better and not even for much like kind of benefit. It's more for the fact that I know that the job is done properly and I've allowed myself to do it and I've done it and I've walked away and I kind of don't have to think about that anymore because I know it's done. I know it's done. You know, so I guess one thing that I should say before I get to, uh, before I move on or, or get carried away with it is I would like, I would definitely suggest, and I'd almost encourage if you've got some sort of idea in your mind that you're half thinking about, like do it, do it. And I give you permission to do it really fucking well, like get excited about it. Don't tell anyone, just think about it in your mind how, how you would do it and, and you'll know that moment when the moment comes and that moment might be now hearing this, do it and do it to a hundred and fucking 15%. And then when you're done and you're looking at it, do it again and do it better. And if you're halfway through it and you realize that, oh fuck, this would have been heaps better if right back at the start I had done this little bit, pull the shit apart and start again. That's the best part because the task is for you. The end product the, the, the end result that you think is important. Sure, it's important. That's great. You know, but the fucking task itself, that's for you. That's for you. You know what I mean? Like you don't go and fucking buy Lego so that you can have a piece of Lego sitting on your shelf in two weeks time. You go and build, buy Lego so you can build it. Otherwise you would just buy the model, you know? And realistically, if you're over 25, either of those situations, you're a fucking weirdo. You shouldn't be buying Lego or models, but you know, I do. And that's cool. But what I'm saying is, is the task is where the gravy is. Like, sure, I would love Black Ink to have a million followers right now, and I would love to have people working for me in a, an, <coughs> sorry, in a warehouse and things happening. But the really cool part is I get to start from scratch. The cool part is I get to go into the future in my mind when I'm Jake who has, um, you know, exactly what I just said, and I get to ask myself, what are the things you wish you did when you had all the time? What are the things you wish you did when you had the time and the energy but not the money? What are the things, what's a little bit of extra effort you wish you put in? And what are the things that I could have done that I thank myself for now because I did do it? I get to do all of those things right now. And it's real simple. It's really simple. The thing that I find the most is sometimes all my bizarre ideas get in the way of the obvious ones. And when I look at like, I sometimes, sometimes I come up with really bizarre ideas that I'll exercise and I'll pressure test and I'll do and... You get to the point you're like, oh, all I needed to do was the very first step of this, but do it really fucking well and I get a 10 times better result. So it's just, it's a case of, I feel like at the very beginning of something is like being as courageous as to not only have a good idea, but be willing to execute it. And then when you've made the decision that you're willing to execute it, to take that full permission to run like a bull at a gate and go and do it and enjoy doing it 
and enjoy being shit at the start. Enjoy being absolutely terrible because now you know that, you know, okay, I've tried this way and it didn't work and now I'm going to try this way. I didn't try, I tried that way and it didn't work and now I'm going to try this way. That whole task process, you know, if you failed over here, but you did the absolute best job and failed, you can tick that off the list as not even a maybe, that's a no. Because I did that to the very best of its ability and it still didn't work. So if I try this over here and try it to the very best of my ability and it still doesn't work, that's great. We've got another no. We're going to try this over here, try it to the best of our ability and it kind of works. Awesome. Now we can just refine the process. We can take out the element that worked and we can move forward. You know, when I used to uh, speed skate, one of the best pieces of advice that I actually, I, I got two pieces of advice that I kind of combined into one. So it's like two, uh, two elements to this. The first one was there are two parts to skating. There's going in a straight line and there's turning around corners, right? You're either pretty dominant in one or the other. You're either really good at corners or really good at straights, especially at the start. Obviously, at the higher level, you want to be pretty good at both. But at the start, you're usually, typically, pretty good at one or the other. Whichever one you're good at, don't worry about it. You're good at it. You need to focus on the thing that you're not good at. So for me, I'm fucking, I, well, I thought I was pretty wicked on corners, but my straights were terrible. So I got to a point where I didn't think anything about corners because I knew that as soon as I hit that corner and leant over, my feet would do it, my shoulders would do it, my body would do it, and I'd be out of the corner quick as I know it. But then I'd just kind of get into the straight and I'd have this awkward, awkward like, oh, I've got to set myself up, get your feet. You kind of get some rhythm. By the time you get some rhythm going nicely, you're into the corner and you're having fun again. So I focused just on the, on the straights. I focused on every part of the straight that I could. I focused on what I was good at, what I was bad at, and then the bad parts you hone in on, you get better at. And the second element of this is skating is the most unhuman thing. And I'm speaking about inline speed skating specifically. If you don't know what it is, look it up. It's just, it's such a weird sport that if you don't know what it is, it, it is genuinely just easy to look up and, and, and understand. It's not on roller skates, it's on inline blades. You wear lycra, helmet, speed skates. You do 50 k's an hour in a, in, in a race against other people. It's, it's a fucking wild sport that deserves to be in the Olympics. Another conversation. But... The interesting thing about speed skating is it's a totally unhuman and unnatural kind of uh, position and exercise. And it's a super technical sport. It's something where you actually don't have to be super fit to do it. You just have to have extremely good technique and then you can build fitness on top of that. And when you talk about technique and your own technique and other people's technique, there are certain things like the, the dominating world champion in ice long track speed skating if you look at his body positioning, it makes no sense. He he literally skates like a, like a beginner skater and somehow the gap between him and everyone else is massive. But he just has that technique and it works for him. And what one of my coaches told me once is, when you're developing your technique, when you're coming up, you know, when you're anywhere between 10 and kind of 18, and because I mean, I did it all through my, my teenage years. The thing that you do when you're developing your own technique is to, you want to appreciate that you're organically going to do something, but you're also going to be a beautiful combination of all the people that you skate with. And the really important thing is to see everyone's technique as they're doing it and try and pick out the part that will help you the most and put it into your profile, right? So I see that him over there, he does this with his shoulders or whatever it might be. I really wish that I could have such good shoulder control the way he does because I know my shoulders do it. And then I notice he has a really good ability to keep his head up and look forward all the times where I dip my head down. So I'm going to try and incorporate that. And I notice he has really good breathing. So I'm going to focus on like what he does for his breathing. And you build this profile, this technique, this identity of skating that's built up of these kind of like all these little bits and pieces of everyone else. And the thing that I like to do, like the thing that I like to like do with that bit of information when I'm cross-referencing it into my life is like, even though I find my business somewhat unrelatable to pretty much anyone around me, like I, I don't really feel like I have anyone in my immediate community that's doing what I'm doing. And even like extended community, I spoke about those boys up in Perth that are running their own online business. It's still, you know, they're, 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 I feel like they're doing a different thing again. It's still apply, like applicable to walk into a transport yard and see things that they're doing that can affect my business or little tips and tricks that I can take. And it's being having such a like, being porous to the idea that you haven't figured it out. Being like available and ready for information 
that may be something that you've thought of before that you've kind of disregarded. It may be something that you look at and immediately go, that's not for me or that's not, not relatable. But understanding that pretty much everything in any circumstance where it has some sort of like reference to reason can help you. So even if it's not a speed skater, looking at other speed skaters for technique kind of advice in a way or like direction, it's understanding that like my business and my being and my like what I'm doing as a human is built up of all these processes stacked on top of one another. And I can look at basically any other sort of process, see how it works, use that process as an analogy and break it down into elements and then see if any of those elements are cross-referenceable into what I do. And if they are, do they have more efficiency? Do they have more purpose? Do they have more meaning? And can I apply them to the way that I live and the way that I operate my business? And if I can, being able to just fucking drop what idea you had and go with the thing that works, giving it permission, letting it have a chance, and even letting it have a good run, even if it proves itself as wrong, then change it back. It's okay, but being like open and available to the idea that you're not the smartest person even in your own situation. And that second part, the, the, sorry, I shouldn't say the second part, the first part, like understanding like right now, I know there are, you know, out of all the elements of my business, I know that there are some of them that I have honed in really well because I've concentrated on them and looked at them really hard. It's being able to go like, okay, that now works. Let's look for the part of my business that doesn't work. Let's look for the, the part of the experience for the customer that hasn't been looked at yet and fix it. Or if you feel like you've been around every single element of your business, starting back at the start and looking at it with eyes as if you've never seen it before, as if you're looking at it from some other consultancy point of view and you're trying to not nitpick it or look for the, for the failure, but you're trying to pressure test it in a way that's healthy. You're trying to let, let it be what it is without any emotional attachment to it and make changes if they need to be made and not having some sort of like hook up on, oh, well, I made it this way and there's X, Y, and Z reason. And look, 100%, I'm the fucking worst for following my own advice. You know, like 100%. But what I, like, what I do like to do is remind myself of these analogies in skating that if you're really good at corners, you need to work on your straights. Or if you're really good at straights, you need to work on your corners. Don't focus on the shit that you're good at. You're good at it. That's great. Fucking Yahoo. You know, we'll get to visit that in six months when you realize it's actually shit also. Another story. But then also... When you have like spent time on something and you know set and forget it and you're like, right, that is what it is and I'm happy with it, we're gonna move on. If you go out into, you, like, I was looking at McDonald's in the drive-thru today. I'm all puffed because I'm excited about this concept. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, see, I wasn't lying. I went through the drive-thru today and realized something interesting. You know, they're giving away those um, glass cups that have McDonald's on the side. And like, this is something that they've done, like Happy Meals, they give you a free toy, right? And these glasses, I think they do it once every year, or once every two years. And even the Monopoly where they give out fucking cheeseburgers and, and all the rest, like that is no different to what I'm doing. So I give away free stickers. You know, if you want to break it down to a technical level, it's a customer acquisition marketing campaign. It, you know, it's just fancy words for giving something out to someone and saying like, hey, just so you know, you know, in some ways it's marketing because you're giving, like if Maccas gives you a glass and you take it home and you put the glass in your in your pantry or your, your cupboard, every time you look at it, you're a mind of a McDonald's. And even if you have McDonald's one more time in a month than you would have had, that glass has paid for itself because I'm telling you to make a hundred million of those glasses, maybe cost them a couple of cents each. By the time it's in your in your cupboard, it might've cost them 25 cents to get there you go and have one meal and it's paid for it. So it's like understanding that even McDonald's, even if it's on a fucking completely different level, you know, it's it's so much more refined and delivered so well, that process of just giving something free to the customer in some sort of campaign or, or, or structure is something that my business can embrace. And trying to trying to like just figure out a way that you can apply that to your business and give something to the customers. So I think that analogy of like looking at everyone around you who isn't even necessarily doing better than you, just people who are doing things and appreciate that everyone, you know, this is the thing. Most people have a reason for the way they're doing things and they might just have a better reason than you have for the way you do your thing. And if that reason stands to reason, 
fuck it, who am I to be better than that reason? You know, and that's where I'm um, like, I think uh, a lot of this term terminology as well, um, where I'm speaking about it, you know, you are not more important than the task. The task is what is what is actually important. It's not the end result. It's the task itself. And the first time I heard it worded like that was Mike Tyson speaking when he when he was um, oh, what do you call it when you're hypnotized? When he was hypnotized, he was always told as a kid, as a boxer, he was always told that he was nothing more than the task of being the greatest boxer in the world or whatever the task was. It was to do with obviously being, you know, super aggressive in boxing and applying that to, to realizing that while black ink is like, it's kind of like my, my thing or like it's my idea that's like now a physical thing. My job in this is nothing more than the task of growing black ink, you know, I'm not any better than delivering one shirt 40 kilometers away from, from where I'm at right now because that's what I'm fucking doing right now. Even if it comes down to like, it doesn't make sense to do it financially because of the fuel or because of the time, or, no, it doesn't matter. Your job is black ink. So did someone buy black ink and you're Mr. Black Ink? Then you need to go deliver black ink to them and remind them why they bought that off you or why they should make the next sale or why they should tell their friend that when they're wearing their shirt, you know, like, oh, yeah, I got this off, off the gun, rah, rah, rah. That's all part of it. That's all part of the task, you know? Anyway, I didn't have much time up my sleeve. We've just clicked over 35 minutes, 36 minutes. So I'm going to check out. But before I check out, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take this bit of advice or just this statement. I give you permission to be great at whatever you want to do. Sometimes the hardest part is just figuring out that thing that you want to do. And even if you're at that stage where you're just like, I don't fucking know, start doing anything. And whatever you do, do it really well. Shit, go and get a job mucking stables at a, at a, at a, at a horse yard just to do that. Because even if you figure out what you don't like doing, you're still a step ahead. You're still a step ahead than where you were. And if you did it to your best, fullest capacity, you know that that's definitely the thing that you don't want to do. So a lot of people get caught in this, you know, like, oh, I did want to do this and I did want to do that. And they hear one story from their friend or they do one Google search, they watch one YouTube video and they get one bit of information that stops them from doing it. Where in reality, the amount of times I've got myself in that situation and realized that one bit of information was so far from what reality was, or even if it was true, how much it didn't affect me until, how much it didn't affect me, you know? It's going out there and getting real firsthand experience, hearing it from the horse's fucking mouth, literally, and realizing that sometimes even the things you don't want to do, that's where the gravy is. That's where the fucking best part of life is. But hey, what do I know? I just make shirts and fucking sell them online. You know what I mean? It's all good. Anyway, if you would like to support me, please do so. Make sure you follow me on Instagram. Uh, follow and like me on Facebook. Uh, you know, like and subscribe the video. Send me a DM. Go and say, go and like save and like all of my photos on Instagram and maybe share a story. Shit, man. I don't care. I appreciate all the support. If you watch this far, thank you. And I uh, hope to speak to you soon. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.